Now, in his budget on Wednesday, the Chancellor announced an extension of the windfall tax, or let's give it its Sunday name, the Energy Profits Levy. It made things, at risk of colossal understatement, quite difficult for the Scottish Conservatives. They, after all, had spent the previous weekend at their conference in Aberdeen reassuring the offshore industry that they were the only party who would stand up for them. Their leader, Douglas Ross, said, told us proudly that he had implored the Chancellor not to do the very thing that he did. And... The Tories in Holyrood had tabled a motion for debate immediately after the budget, specifically laying out the damage a windfall tax extension would do. So how on earth could this have happened? And how much of a gift is it to the Tories' opponents here in what is, after all, an election year? Well, I'm joined to discuss all this by the Conservative MSP Stephen Kerr. Good morning. Good morning, Martin. So, uh, embarrassing. Uh, how damaging has this episode let, been? Let me say it's disappointing. You want to see embarrassing? I'm going to say it's disappointing. Uh, that you know, that what we had wanted didn't happen. But look, the budget as a whole needs to be seen in its context, and also the position of the Scottish Conservatives needs to be seen in context. We are the party that will stand up and does stand up for the oil and gas sector. That's obvious now. Well, you don't. You're the party that has just effectively shafted the oil and gas sector because you think that this is a policy that could cost tens of thousands of jobs. We're talking about an extension of the levy in the year, to the year 2029, we believe that it is wrong to extend the levy to that, uh, to that year and we will be doing everything in our power to persuade the government that it is a mistake to do so. Why, yes. didn't, why didn't Jeremy Hunt listen to the overtures from your leader in Scotland and from his own energy minister? Well, every year um, since 2017, to my knowledge, we have presented uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister a uh, list of things that we as Scottish Conservatives wanted to see included in a budget statement. And sometimes those things have been agreed to and sometimes they haven't. That's the nature of the pre-budget discussion. But, yeah, I mean, look, I'm not running away from the fact we're disappointed. But, look, we are still the party that is unequivocally standing up for the oil and gas sector. Look at our position in comparison with the SNP. How can the SNP stand up and say that they are the defenders of oil and gas in the North East? That's laughable. The Labour Party's position on oil and gas is even worse in the sense that they would not only uh, increase the levy and extend it, but they would also take away the investment allowances. No, we are the party that stands up for oil and gas and we'll continue to lobby our government in order to see that that extra year, 28, 29, is, 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 is not there. The Chancellor appeared on the Today programme the morning after he delivered his budget. He was asked on that programme, who are the losers from your budget? Yeah. And he said, non-DOMS and the Scottish oil and gas industry. Yeah. You're not standing up for them. He said, I am making sure, I have taken measures to make sure you lose from yeah. my budget. Words, the words he yeah, chose. Those were the words he used. I understand that. I don't happen to think those are very wisely chosen words from the Chancellor, frankly. To describe the oil and gas sector as the Scottish oil and gas sector seems to me to be a bit careless on the part of the Chancellor. That's my personal view. But look, as far as the Conservatives go, the Conservative Party is the party that the oil and gas sector knows is on their side. you just got to look at the other parties. You're looking at me... I, I am, because I'm, I'm just quizzically. remembering the fact that the Chancellor, the Conservative Chancellor, has told them that they are losers. By the extension... You're not on the their levy, side. By the extension of the levy by one year. 2028 to 2029. It's going to cost them one now, and a half going, billion we, pounds. We are, going, we are going to use all of our resources, all of our energies to persuade our party uh, at Westminster, the Chancellor, that it's the wrong choice. Douglas Ross could not be clearer. He's going to use his formidable uh, powers of persuasion in order well, to... But they're not formidable. Case. He tried to persuade the Chancellor. He sat well, across formidable. the desk in Downing Street from the oh, Chancellor on Monday night and oh, got oh, nothing out of it. Oh, no, they are formidable, Martin, because the Chancellor himself gave credit to Douglas Ross for the freeze on alcohol duty. So we have a, a record of being able to persuade the freeze government. Freeze alcohol duty every year. Uh, that's not true. Well, I come on. Last it, year, it, I, uh, sorry, that's it, not factually correct. OK. No, and, and, and when the Chancellor... In comparison to this... For, for, ..for bringing about the freeze on alcohol duty, then, then, then that is evidence of the fact that we are in there... Look, I'm proud of the fact that Scottish Conservatives are in there lobbying uh, our colleagues at Westminster for policies that we believe are in the best interests of the north-east of Scotland, of Scotland, of the UK as a whole. Let's game out the calculation the Chancellor was making. He was desperate, we were reading in the papers, to get 2% off national insurance. And he was working out how to do it. Where can I get that money from? I don't quite have the money yet. 1% doesn't look good enough. I've got to give people something a little bit more. I need the money to do 2%. And he's thought, oil and gas, that'll do. And he's chucked you under the bus. I well, mean, is that well, calculation... No. 
Tory seats in Scotland no, don't got, really matter you, to you, us. No, no, that's absolutely not the case. You've got to look at the budget as a whole. Well, do you extend uh, that courtesy to the SNP when they publish their budget in Scotland? You don't. You pick out individual policies and scrutinise them. You don't no, see no, it no, 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 we, as we, a whole at all. Oh, no, we do. Absolutely. That's why we voted against the SNP government. We looked at that in parts and as and a whole. And then attack individual then, policies, and which is what people are doing here. Because it's a bad budget. It's the tax and acts budget of all times. That's what that is. Right, let's look so at your voted, budget. So we voted against the SNP budget. To be absolutely clear, we, were, we are against the SNP budget. It's bad for Scotland. But in terms of the 2% cut, uh, which is the second, there was a 2% cut in the autumn statement, a 2% cut now in the spring budget. And that's good, because what that's doing is putting money into people's pockets at a point where households are hard-pressed. Taking $1.5 billion off the energy sector. But you combine those cuts in national insurance for working people with the changes in child benefit which were announced as well and it's a really good budget for households and for the fact that they you know putting putting money into people's pockets is good for economic activity and economic growth and we are the party that has the long-term plan for economic growth it, you're you hope to be an mp you're moving from holyrood to westminster if yeah. things go your way in the election this yeah. year in an angus constituency mm. Will this have damaged your hopes, do you think? Will your chances in that election? There no. were people who live in that constituency who commute to energy jobs in the yeah, northeast. Well, the Prime Minister visited Montrose um, as part of his time that he spent with us in the northeast of Scotland yeah. on the weekend of our conference. So, so will it down? Look, the reality is that uh, we are going to be working hard to persuade the Chancellor about that ex ex extension of that one year, 2028 to 2029. We think it's a bad idea. Um, I don't think it damages the Scottish Conservatives in the slightest, and I'll tell you why. Because we are showing that we are the party that will stand up for the best interest of Scotland, for the best interest of the North East of Scotland, for the best interest of the oil and gas sector. And I have absolutely no, no qualms about saying that. I, and I, I believe I mean, people, people recognise that. And we also recognise that the Scottish Conservatives in many parts of Scotland are the party to go to, to vote for, in order to defeat this, this SNP government. It seems almost inevitable when there's a, a Conservative uh, politician on this programme that I have to ask them about the Murdo Fraser idea from several years ago. Shouldn't you just break off and become a separate party? Whether it's because of Liz Truss or Boris Johnson or Lee Anderson is or it, Suella Braverman Martin, or Kemi Badenoch. But, no, well, there's always no, something, some reason they're causing you problems. It's a very interesting list you've just created of people. But, but well, there are people who don't said, help no, you here. There is no need for us to do that. What the evidence of the last week shows is that the Scottish Conservatives under Douglas Ross will stand up and fight Scotland's and corner. Lose. And, and lose. Not all the time. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we win. Don't be so negative. The reality is that there are many occasions where the Conservative Party in Scotland is the leading voice defending Scotland's interests. Tell and, me, and that will continue. And that's why we need strong voices at Westminster. So no, so no chance that Murdo Fraser's idea is going to be revisited, that actually you split off and campaign on a different platform. Put a centre-right party in we, Scotland without the Conservative. Slightly more toxic, if you but, want to use that word, Conservative branding on it. I'm talking no, about some of Lee Anderson's so, 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 opinions, so for I example. Don't, I don't accept that the Conservative brand is toxic at all. And I don't think there's any... Look, we already have proven time and time again that we are, a, as a discreet uh, political active uh, organisation stand up for Scotland's interests. And that's what we'll continue to do. That's what I did when I was an MP. That's what I want to do by, uh, when I go back to Westminster. Can Andrew that's Bowie what That's what we're doing, by the way, in Hollywood. We're standing up for Scotland's best interests. Can Andrew Bowie, the energy minister, sur survive this? Of course he can. How? How course do, course what he can. does he do when this comes to a vote? Well, what he's going to... What, first of all, let me say this about Andrew. Andrew's a first-class minister. I mean, he's not called atomic well, perhaps Bowie. Perhaps not for long. Not How called, does he survive a he's vote? He's not called atomic Bowie for nothing. Well, what does he do when this comes to a vote? Job well, I tell you, you, do, you don't have to leave the government to represent the best interests of your constituents. No, but, and but Andrew, Andrew will he, do he that. He says and he disapproves away, of this policy. He can't possibly away. vote for and it, can he? Away. And if he doesn't vote for it, he gets sacked. And, Martin, we're a ways away from the moment where there will be a vote. And in the meantime, the, the, the conversations, the persuasion will go on. So you think we this might change? I, I have no idea what will change. Well, I, 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 what, what we are setting out to do is to persuade the government that this idea of extending the levy... By one, and th let's not forget that the Labour Party, and if they were ever the government of this country, they would up the levy, they'd have it for the entirety of the parliament, 
There's no debate about that. And they take away all the investment allowances. That would be devastating. The industry itself has said tens of thousands of job will, jobs will go under a Labour government with that prospectus. And that's, how many why, jobs that's will go... why we are so energised at standing up for Scotland's uh, interests. How many jobs will go as a consequence of this extension? Well, I, I, I have no idea uh, what the consequences of it is. This is a thoroughly bad idea. And we will be doing our little best to persuade our government that it's not a good idea. But at the end of the day, look at the alternative. Okay. What we've got to keep in focus is this, that the Scottish Conservatives are sticking up for oil and gas. Okay. They're sticking up for the North East and the Labour Party and the SNP. Well, it's la laughable for them yep. to claim that they're standing up for oil and gas because they're clearly not. Let's move this on a little bit. You, you, were, you were quite proudly telling me before we came on air that you've got a big voice in Scottish politics. Let me, let well, me take that stage further. Well, let me suggest you're a bit of a... No, I said loud. I a loud I voice. A loud voice. Okay, a loud voice. Big voice. In Scottish politics, let, 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 let me let me take that a stage further. Let me suggest to you, you're a bit of a bruiser. You're a guy who you're a slugger. You're a guy who likes the rough and tumble of politics. I'm getting to a point here. Yeah. First Minister's questions this week, very shouty. Douglas Ross yes. shouting at Angus Robertson. Yes. It's increasingly febrile. The atmosphere it seems every yes. week in, in First Minister's questions. PMQs similar. Westminster is 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 quite yes. nasty atmosphere at the moment. Out there, I think people are perhaps giving up on politics and politicians as a consequence mm. of all the heat. Mm. Do you think it's time to take the temperature of politics down a bit? So there's always been raucous moments in the parliamentary week at Westminster and at Holyrood. And there's always been a clash of ideas that sometimes spills over, over heaps. I agree with you, though, that the public want mature politics. They want politicians to talk to each other sensibly. They don't want them to be in the business of name calling and, and all of the childishness that people associate with politics. So I agree with you. I think what people are looking for is sensible, mature, reflective uh, debate, but I don't think they want their politicians all to be, uh, you know, meeting in a public library. I think they, they appreciate the fact that a democracy that's lively will sometimes be a okay. little bit messy and, and a little bit loud, but at the end of the day... I mean, what happened on Thursday in FMQs? Um, I mean, Douglas Ross um, uh, responded to something that Angus Robertson had said. He, he, Douglas was addressing an issue, very mm. serious issue, uh, in a very serious way, a very okay. responsible way, about the NHS. And, and, and Angus Robertson said, who cares? Well, that, that, did, that did somewhat trigger Douglas for very good reason. Because we I'm not care, sure. I'm not sure care. that was the comment that was, no, that was being no, that, described after that. Well, that I think was, it was something else was exactly, he was alleged to have said. That but was exactly it wasn't the comment. picked up by, that, the, by the presiding yeah, officer. Yeah. Listen, let me ask you on the issue of tone in politics, though. Yes. There was an article in the Telegraph, on the front page of the Telegraph, about the First Minister yes. yesterday that the Scottish Government have described, and the First Minister has described as borderline racist and Islamophobic. No. You, you are, well, they have. You're the yeah. person who's quoted in it. You yes. said, Hamza Yusuf has a clear conflict of interest in the awarding of aid to Gaza because so many of his family members are either living there or involved in Palestinian organisations. Yeah. There are questions about what his motivations are for using taxpayers' money in that area. Yeah. Given your time again, would you retract that? Would you have softened that quote no. or do you what, stand by that? What, it's an extraordinary thing to say. What questions are there about his motivations? Well, what, what, there are questions about how it came about that £200,000 that had been allocated to UNICEF for a water project was overnight on one email pivoted and redirected. Um, as as, now, as governments now, around now, the world did, now, because now, UNRWA, enough, the organisation they gave money to, was getting it in fast and, and in a flexible now, way. Now, 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 fair enough. So all I'm asking is, and it's not an unreasonable thing to ask, and I don't think we as a party or people in general have an unreasonable ask here, and that is, what exactly happened and why was that decision made? That is all that we're asking. Would you ask that of Rishi merit, Sunak? Or is it, the uh, fact uh, that the First Minister is a Muslim? It is the role the and responsibility of, of a member of Parliament, whether at Westminster or Holyrood, to scrutinise the operation of government and to hold the government to account. There is nothing unusual in asking questions about how decisions were made and why they were made. And the reaction of the First Minister, I felt, was an overreaction. Now, listen, I happen to agree with him on some of the things he said about the nature of our politics and the identity politics and all of that stuff that he mentions in his uh, social media posts. But that's not the point. That is not the point that I'm trying to make. There are the questions issue, about his motivations. The whole reason Do you regret we, those words? The, the whole reason we have 
uh, a ministerial code that protects ministers for, uh, on issues of, of uh, conflicts of interest uh, it, it is exactly the issue that I'm raising. There are questions about no his one, motivations. Do no, you regret no those one, words? I, 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 regret, I do not regret doing my job as a parliamentarian in scrutinising the, the work of the Scottish Government, including the work of the First Minister. That is why we have parliamentarians, and that is my job, and I will continue doing it. Do you so regret I won't be the words you chose? I will not be apologising for doing my job. Do you regret the words you chose? Could you have worded it more carefully? I, I, do, I don't regret the words I used. No, I don't. OK. Straight, I, and I don't, see, I don't see why, because, because I think... Look, no one who watched the, the trauma that the First Minister went through during those days and weeks when his family were, 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 were stuck, uh, locked in Gaza. I mean, of course there was, a, there was an issue of personal interest. Of course there was. And therefore it's not wrong I, in the slightest. I don't it's think not... everybody will accept there was an issue of personal interest well, there. You can, you can simultaneously have a personal interest in that or a, a personal involvement in that situation and run a country and, and devote money to a broader cause, and, can you not? You don't and, have to be compromised and that being, just because you and have that, family in there. That being the case, the question is very simple. What happened and why did it happen? All right, we will leave it there and move on, but thank you very much indeed for your time and your candour. Stephen Kerr, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.